Hello and welcome to Stupid Ancient History with Midgley and Taylor and our expert, non-expert and special guest James, Lord High Commander of the Science Cupboard, first of his name and knower of nothing. Forgot we did that. Hello. <laughs> As always, we're wearing our finest togas and today we're going to look at myth, reality and Augustus. So previously on Stupid Ancient History, we started charting the earliest origins of Rome, starting with the heroic Trojan warrior Aeneas. Yeah, I had a few questions about him. <laughs> yeah, and how he set off on a great voyage from the doomed city in 1200 BC and eventually made his way to the shores of Italy. I had some issues with that as well. <laughs> <laughs> and after de defeating a local upstart king, got married, had a son and went on to settle Alba Longa. Uh, again, had issues with that. <laughs> And then we skip forward to 770 BC and the miraculous birth of Romulus and Remus, saved from death by a she-wolf. I was fine with that bit. Oh, is that all right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that bit made sense. <laughs> and finally, how the rivalry of the twins led to the death of Remus and Romulus founding Rome. Twins are evil. Don't, there's always a good <laughs> one in the evil. you should know, James. Oh, I, I'm, the, I'm the Remus. My twin would have been a second. Thought so. <laughs> So you seem a little bit uh, snippy, shall we say, James, <laughs> about our previous podcast and what was said. What is your issue with what we were talking about? It's clearly all true, completely. Uh, no, I say to that, <laughs> uh, I'm sure there might be the little facts peppered in, but it was all nonsense. Mm, fair enough. <laughs> I take your point. There might be some parts of it that are not completely true. And you're probably not the only one that's been scratching the head thinking, huh? how, how did that happen? Yeah. Really? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the stuff we've already talked about uh, and will do later on is definitely more mythical than factual. You can't believe some of this stuff actually happened. Yeah. No, not really. And there are huge question marks over whether many of these individuals existed or not. We're almost 100% certain that Aeneas didn't. Yeah. We're probably also 100% certain that a wolf didn't rescue and raise two small children. So... If that's the case, then you're almost certain he didn't exist. Yeah. Why do you teach him, and why are we bother talking about him? Well, it, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Okay. Uh, so go on. What? What? Why do we bother with him if we don't know that much about them? Or if we doubt they exist. Even <laughs> why? Well, why do we bother? Well, most simplistically, the answer is time. Um, these events happened so long ago that there's so little evidence from that period that what was created and any evidence that did exist has since been lost okay. in the depths of time. Yeah, and the thing is, the little evidence that does exist tells us something, but not really enough to be 100% certain, so we've got to use other things as well. Okay, well, I have a science background, and you said evidence, so come on, I, I, I'm a person who thrives We're on evidence and proof. <laughs> he knows what we mean now. Yeah. It's like you don't trust us. I don't, at right. all. Shocking. Um, fair enough, I suppose, but I think you're completely wrong. Obviously, everything that we say is golden. <laughs> Gems of wisdom. <laughs> I only wish people could hear what you talk about when, <laughs> when the microphone's I turned don't, off. because I might get sacked. <laughs> so, if we start at the very beginning with Troy, we do have some archaeological evidence that shows it was a large, well-defended and powerful city, and that they did have a terrible disaster around... Um, 100 BC. 1000 BC. 1000 BC. Sorry, I can't read. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, this is this is a really good example of the problem. So there is archaeologists say that Troy was there mm -hmm. and it was this city and something terrible happened, um, but we don't know what. Given where it is, it may well have been an earthquake. We certainly don't think it ties in with what Homer says about a thousand Greek ships they, coming they, over. They didn't find a giant wooden horse outside. No, there. no wooden <laughs> horses. But it's that idea of these things will have happened in some way or form and then you get people like Homer who've taken events and written stories about them. So you've got to try and match up the two. How did Romans like record their history? Because I know kind of the Persians said there wasn't a lot of um, stuff written down. They weren't particularly you know, it, historical. It, again, it depends on which Romans. Right, okay. So the problem with saying the Romans is it's effectively a thousand years of history. So at the time when Livy is writing, um, there's huge amounts of evidence and huge amount of detail. They wrote a lot because obviously language and 
the alphabet was so much more developed. The very, very early stuff is a little more complicated because the alphabet doesn't really emerge and even though things do start getting written down, it's very, very patchy. Okay. So we're effectively trying to match the stories that you have to what actual bits of archaeology yeah. you can find. I was going to say, a lot of it is the oral side of things, isn't it? Yeah. It's oral history, which has got massive issues in itself when it you're using like that Chinese as evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you've got to really think and use it with a pinch of salt, haven't you? So you've got to use everything in conjunction with everything else to get some kind of idea of what might have happened. Yeah. But what you'll find as we go through the examples is there is stuff there and stuff did happen, but the stories that have grown up around this stuff is where the mythology comes in, because right. people just don't know. Right, so you said Troy is a place, yep. big awful thing, people will have migrated away from it. Yep. Uh, there was a bit of a gap in what you were telling me last <laughs> yeah. time, though. It, wh what was it, about 400 years? Between yeah. Troy and, and like Romulus, the, yeah. Yeah, so what, what happened in the... The, you know, that little, that short little short period of time. time. Well, I mean, the, the issue with saying 400 years, given this time span, I mean, 400 years may as well have been four at this point. Yeah, so even though there's a huge amount of time between Aeneas and Romulus, the problem is that little changes in terms of evidence, so we're still almost enti entirely, entirely, well, can't get my fit words out, relying on scraps of archaeology. That like, doesn't really change. What archaeology? What, what have we found? So, if you look at Romulus, there are a few kind of key things that we can look at. And the first thing we're going to look at is something called the Romulus Huts. Which I've, hopefully will be on the screen. Yeah. I've seen them. They're on Palatine Hill, aren't they? They are, absolutely. I mean, these are claimed to be evidence of a Bronze Age settlement on Palatine Hill dating back to the time when Romulus founded his city. Hmm. So, like you said, they're there, there's the foundations, they're a bit scrappy. Um, there is some question as to whether they, they are authentic. Some people have suggested maybe it was the later Romans who kept, dug them and went, ooh, look at this. Right, and okay. certainly when Augustus was building on Palatine Hill, he made a big deal of, look at the Romulus huts. So it's almost like Romans using their own archaeology to say, well, it's archaeology, it's history, isn't it? It's propaganda. That's what it is. Yeah. So what to like to use like the Romulus what's to legitimise the, the, the mi history mi of the Rome. Myth. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. they're saying, oh, everyone knows this story about Rome. Here is the proof. Right. Okay. I mean, it doesn't prove anything really. It, it proves that there was a settlement on Palatine Hill. Yeah. Um, which you would expect because it's quite. A steep hill you've been up it many times i have uh is it not also a little bit coincidental that they happened to build their settlement on the place where the imperial palace went well i think it was more that the the imperial palace came after and oh this is a good place you, right okay you plebs get down the hill <laughs> in the bog but yeah so there, there's little this is what we mean there's scraps of evidence that people find and then they go oh well this clearly proves this is where romulus set up his city whereas it doesn't have a little sign saying Romulus's gaff, keep out. Uh, you should do. It, it, make, should it make history a lot easier, I expect. <laughs> so the second piece of archaeology and evidence we should look at in this same kind of vein is this Etruscan funeral urn, which should be on the screen right now. Again, this directly ties to the Romulus huts because the shape of this urn, the way it is built, it's believed to be like the most likely representation of a typical Etruscan or Italian dwelling at the time. Yeah, so they're basically little play models of the Romulus huts, aren't they? Yes, yeah, so which be, is convenient. You'd be burned <laughs> and stored forever in a little version of your house. Do they come with doors? Because it just looks <laughs> like quite open plan at the moment. You, you'd assume so, but certainly when you think about um, how Livy describes this early Rome and what we think of about Rome. It's, it's not the tall buildings, there's no pillars to be seen. Yeah. It's basically mud huts, you know, so it's not the Rome that we necessarily think of. But how, how long before the Rome we think of is this? That about 700 years. Right. Yeah, so, so it's they've... just development, isn't it? It's yeah. all like with Britain, it's the same, you, have, you start off with mud huts with the Anglo-Saxons and then build up to nice big fancy buildings. It's the same mud thing. huts in East Manchester. Uh, my mud hut's lovely, that's where I still live, according to you, if we believe what you say anyway. I do live in East Manchester. I don't live in a mud hut though. 
so these little huts you're showing, none of this really screaming kings, because that, that was the start of the discussion, wasn't <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, these ones. King of the mud huts. King of the mud huts. <laughs> so we have to look at something else as well. So there's another thing which is called the Lapis Niger Stella. So it's an Etruscan piece of archaeology, but more importantly, it references the word king. So it, it gives us an insight into the type of government structure that was in place at the time. What is that? Stella, did you say? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's Not like, the bear, James. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it literally means black stone. Okay. Um, it's this column that had been dug up in the Roman Forum. It's got early Etruscan writing on it. Um, it's a bit damaged, so it's not complete. You don't know the full extent of the text, but it does mention things like the king. So we can say from that it dates to this period. It's a safe bet that if they're in embedding it on stone, that then the government was run by a king, which okay. fits because it's a straightforward form of government, nothing fancy or complicated like Athenian democracy. So it contextually fits. But it's a sign, isn't it, for them as well? It's another thing they can use as a piece of positive, positive propaganda that shows that they were civilised because they've got yeah. a governmental structure in place, even right. if it is I mean, only quite a simplistic one. Yeah, and there's a, there's a very small gap between local warlord and king, basically how fancy a hat is. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you get this idea of it, it's a, a rule by an individual. Are you confident that that is genuine? Because if there's kind of dispersion on the wrong list what's yeah no mate. the good thing with the the lapis nigra stella is you can test it archaeologically it fits in with everything else at the time it's a solid thing that you can look at also in terms of the development of the language it's written in ancient etruscan which then merges with greek and becomes latin okay so it, it, the stella fits nicely in the timeline okay so you kind of Demonstrate that sometimes the archaeology is not the best. No, it, it's open to period. interpretation. Yeah, but um, what about records and stuff? You, uh, yeah, I know you all love a, we well, love a receipt if you're Persian, but yeah, I know yes. you, you, love, you love your little scrolls and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, I, I do love a scroll. Like, <laughs> you read a scroll with a cup of cocoa every night. Uh, for does does any of that survive from this period? Well, yeah, some... some. Well, hmm. Unsure. So again, time is not really our friend. It's no. starting to get a little bit better, isn't it, Mr. Mitchell? Yeah, it's starting to. So, um, what was their predominant way of writing at this point? Was it on stone or paper? We'll get to that because okay. it depends on who you are and who's doing the writing. Ah, okay. So, round about 750, 753 BC, when the foundation of Rome is supposedly happening, this is round about the same time as the kind of the Greek alphabet becomes prominent around the Mediterranean. Right. Okay. It's about. It's also the, exactly. We should point out. It's the same time that Homer starts writing. So is it's it, almost like the alphabet emerges, and all of a sudden, people start writing stuff down. Is this like the phonetic alphabet? Like it's Greek linear B. So it's it's what it's closest to what we'd see as a modern Greek language. Right. Okay. But it's a move away from kind of pictographic language, like hieroglyphics. Yeah. To well, a more usable, so yeah, so you can alpha. kind of conjugate words from. Yeah, and yeah. You, more importantly, you can write things down that aren't kind of religious and sacred. Yeah. So also around that time, the Greeks start settling in the south of Italy, and they start writing things down as well. Yeah. So we reckon that much of any written information, or certainly these written stories about what's happening in Rome, has had to travel south. So the stories have to travel south to places like Sicily where the Greeks are settling and then the Greeks start writing things down. Okay. Yeah. So the only problem with that is that it's really only the exciting stories that get passed along and obviously they get embellished because as we were yeah. saying before, if it's if it's something that's passed down by word of mouth, as you said, they will get changed and they will get altered. So yeah, they're gonna be okay. kind of travellers stories. Someone travelling to the south meeting some Greeks, talking to them, what did you hear, what's this, and they start writing them down. Right, okay. So it, it, it's massively kind of, it ends up being Chinese whispers. Yeah. This is where the wolf comes along. And Was this just general migration or did something happen to make these Greeks settled in that's southern it, Italy? It's more general migration because historically what we find is tribes get pushed further south, they move into regions like Attica where Athens is, 
they can't then sustain the population. So this is where you get this spread of Greeks right across the Mediterranean, the Aegean, into the Black Sea, pretty much everywhere. Okay. Greeks love trading and settling, but wherever they go, they write things down. Um, and yeah, like I said, so the sto early histories of Rome is probably heavily mythologized um, because most of the stories are recorded by these things that have been written down by the Greeks at this time. Yeah, and it's not helped by the fact that when Rome was sacked by the Gauls in 290 BC and a lot of the evidence that probably was there was destroyed. Right, so okay. all that so does survive is the fairy tales, the folklore, the myths. Right, okay. But they're still trying to cobble together some history out of what's left. So you've not got like a really reliable history up to this point, have we? No, that is true. I mean, and to be fair, Livy himself highlights this in his preface to his work. Um, even though he claims to have read all of the histories of Rome, interestingly, he says all of the Greek histories okay. of Rome. So again, suggesting this earlier stuff. Um, he himself says that his material, the material he's covering, is more for the work of poets rather than for history. So he's right, acknowledging. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and he, he kind of openly admits that he has limited, um, secure evidence to work from, hence why there's a lot of folklore and there's a lot of myth. Okay. So at yeah. least he's being honest, kind of laying it all out. Yeah, and again, this is sometimes why he gives two versions of mm. the story. Like the she-wolf says, oh, traditionally it was a she-wolf, uh, prostitute. Yeah. The other thing we've got to consider with Livy, though, is the time when he's writing. Cause he's, he's not just writing after the event, he's writing at a really, really important time. Yeah, so when Livy's writing his history, Augustus has just become the first emperor, and he's busy kind of rebuilding Rome. So when we talk about rebuilding Rome, he's basically using everything at his disposal to try and put across a new version of what Rome will be like. So it's a bit like New Labour mm. when they came in, yeah. it's like New Britain, it's that kind of rebranding of the whole of the, the country and also of how it's being ruled and everything like that. So all of this evidence that's there, he's using to kind of make a link between himself and Rome's past but also to kind of create a new, a new identity, a new for, identity the for the Romans. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Didn't, didn't someone have a dream that Augustus would be this amazing? And that ruler? was it. Yeah, that was it. That was in the year. In the year. So yeah, he's, he's rebuilding Rome not just physically after the civil war, but he's rebuilding the idea right, of okay. what is Rome to the Romans because they've been through years of civil war. They're all pretty fed up with being yeah. Roman. It's not great to be Roman because of all the problems we've had. So he's trying to rebuild it. Was it still not better to be Roman than anybody else? Well, though? yeah, but the, you know, they're starting to be a bit more critical of themselves. So he's trying to rebuild this idea of Rome. He's going through a rebrand, isn't it? Yeah. So it's like, Rome it's similar, it's very similar as well when you think about like the royal family, when they pushed the younger people out to try and rebrand yeah. the royal family when they've been in the wilderness for quite a long time. It's that kind of idea. I that don't know if you'd describe Buckingham <laughs> Palace as the wilderness. Well, no, but you know what I've I always mean. thought Balmoral was quite <laughs> feral. <laughs> it's, that, it's that kind of idea, isn't it? So yeah. all of these different things, the poets that we've talked about before, um, and then we've got the archaeological evidence and all of this, he's using all of this to say, look, Rome is great. I'm linked to Rome's past. My ancestors helped to found, like, find Rome in the beginning, and now we're going to re-find Rome and make it once again into this amazing empire yeah. and this wonderful right. and, place. And this is where someone like Livy comes in. Yeah, yeah, because it's very much about propaganda. So works like Livy's History of Rome intend to give the Romans a great history of their origins and make themselves feel awesome about being Roman. So who was this propaganda for? Was it who could read at that time? It's not necessarily who could read because again, like stories, poem, epic poems and they so on, they'd, they'd get passed around, they'd be performed in the streets. Because there's, no, there's no cinemas, so you go to the forum, yeah. listen to someone read. But, so, so the, but this was everyone, it was like rich, down to poor, yeah. it was... Yeah, was the it? rich would be reading it, the poor would be listening to right, it. Okay. It was, it was building in this idea of history but with popular entertainment so it's okay. kind of like uh historical fiction yeah but, but also the other thing is especially if we're thinking about the, the wealthier sections of society like the senators and things like that he's got to 
kind of put himself across, justify why he's now taking control of Rome. Mm. So that's the other thing that he's using it for. It's not just about making Rome seem great, he also needs to make himself seem great because he needs to be able to say, basically, I know I've just taken power and nicked it off somebody else, but I am the right person to be leading Rome. It's kind of the destiny of me and of Rome that I am in charge. It's kind of fate that I'm going to lead Rome okay. through its next revival and turn it into this mm. amazing place. But if you don't like that, it can always kill you. Well, true. Yeah. <laughs> so did this work? Did it make the Romans feel better about themselves and being Roman? Well, I mean, one thing Augustus says is he is keen to re-establish this idea of morality as well. It's the idea that the Romans have just got a little bit seedy, a bit corrupt. Okay. Um, and give them a sense of what is right and wrong. So clear guidance on how to be a good Roman. And Livy even chips in with this. So it says, There is something especially beneficial and useful in studying what happened long ago, because you can look at examples of everything that can happen, clearly set out in a record. From this you can take for yourself and your country things to copy and things which are rotten from start to finish which you can avoid. On the other hand, unless my love for this job which I have started has tricked me, there has never been a country either more powerful or with better morals or with so many good examples to follow. Laying in on a bit there. <laughs> Rome's okay yeah. Yeah. in Livy's idea. So yeah, so he's openly saying, look, in this I'm going to include examples of good guys and bad guys. And some of the bad guys become almost like pantomime villains. Yeah, you, you, you okay. can accuse a lot of his characters, these kings, they're a bit one-dimensional, some of them. Um, and But there's also some reflections of kind of how Augustus wants to be viewed mm. in Livy's work. Yeah, and there's nothing quite as obvious as that as Virgil basically name-checking Augustus in the Aeneid. But it is there. It, it's definitely there. You'll see little hints of kings where the better kings that are written about, they're doing things that sort of mirror what Augustus did right, later okay. on. So like, oh, this is a great idea. Yeah, mm. no, that guy did it, and we all know he was cool. Yeah. So it's almost kind of the kind of ref most subtly referencing what Augustus is trying to do, but saying, oh, look, these people in the past, these awesome guys, mm. they were trying to do it, and the people who don't like Augustus, they're doing what these bad guys were doing. Yeah. So he, he's kind of... It's like the classic Western white hats and black hats, good guys, bad yeah. guys. Yeah. But it's also this idea, isn't it, that it's like we were just saying on the previous slide, he's justifying Augustus's position and it's something that he's using to basically say, well, I was always going to be the person to be in charge of Rome and I'm a really good person as well. I'm the right person to be in charge. So it's very subtle propaganda. That's Some of it is subtle. Definitely aimed at the educated of, classes. The educated classes, yeah. That's what is there. It's it's just like politicians will try and draw similarities between themselves and Churchill. It's yeah. that kind of idea, isn't it? It's the same. The good bits pick, of Churchill, yeah, not the racist someone, bits. No, pick someone that the country sees as having a positive impact. Try and link yourself to them. Mm. And then they'll see you as having a positive impact. Yeah, I mean, really, with this whole kind of Augustan regime the thing to do is you know if we are to dismiss the factual accuracy of what Livy's saying about this early history of Rome it's not necessarily about the factual accuracy of what happened it's more about what the stories tell us about the Romans in Livy's time and what they thought about okay. their history is yeah. that fair to say yeah it is and it also shows us what Augustus wants the Romans to think about him yeah. Which is really important as well, because it, it might not be true, but it gives us a really kind of clear view of how Augustus wants to be viewed, which is just as important as what it's actually saying. Yeah. So if you use it and kind of read between is, the lines... It's fair to point out here as well that on the old spec for the kings of Rome, they did keep mentioning the Romans at Livy's time rather than the early kings. So yeah. It's like a history within a history. Okay. So there you have it, the first of probably what will keep cropping up, our quick look at myth, history and the role of, in, role of Augustus in all of this. We hope this has been useful, thank you for listening, leave us a comment below and until next time, goodbye. Bye. Bye.